Well, Trek Zone's gotten just that little bit bigger today, an extra podcast and an extra time slot during the week. And to help me do that is cosmologist and astrophysicist at the Australian National University, Dr. Brad Tucker. Brad, thanks for coming to Trek Zone. Always, always. Now, we're going to be doing this every Tuesday. We're going to be talking, tr- uh, not talking Trek, that's Lee Sargent. He uh, he pops by every month on a Friday, but we're talking science. Uh, and we're going to have a few headlines. You're going to give us some, some depth on the headlines in science and space news of the week. Uh, and leading our podcast today, uh, India is testing an anti-satellite weapon. What's going on over there? Yeah. Yeah, again, you know, it sounds almost sci-fi, like it should belong in a different segment, right? You know, it's uh, this was a a test last week where they kind of surprised everyone, where they launched an ICBM to destroy a satellite as a show of a test of what they can do. Uh, so now, what you do essentially is you launch one of these big intercontinental ballistic missiles, and then you have this little homing device missile on the top that, when it gets into orbit, it hones on the satellite and destroys the satellite. Uh, And so Thursday they announced like, hey, we just blew a satellite out of the sky uh, or the near earth atmosphere rather. Uh, And it was a biggest surprise. You know, there are only three other countries have done this, the US, Russia and China in latest in 2007. Is it concerning that that India have tested this or is this sort of just the way that you progress with uh, low earth orbit uh, space flight? No, no, this is a, a bit of concern, you know, when China did in 2007. The problem is when you blow something up in space, it produces lots of pieces of debris, which get stuck floating around, producing space junk, crashing into things. And there was a kind of a big, hey, all right, we know there's value or purpose or meaning to doing this, but there's a lot of consequences. And and everyone openly admits, in fact, the NASA administrator, Jim Brennan, on Friday said, look, you know, if we ruin space in terms of pollution, we don't get another shot. Uh, and it's something Australia is trying to do is clean up space junk. So it was met with a big a bit of condemnation. And also, you know, what we call the militarization of space is a big deal. And people don't know where that's headed because there's a lot of gray area, right? Space is for the peaceful purpose. But launching something from the Earth and destroying a satellite in orbit doesn't fall under like either jurisdiction. So it's a bit of a weird gray area. It almost sounds a little bit like uh, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars project in the uh, 1980s. Yeah, it is. Am and I well, on the right track? No, yeah. And look, and like following in, to be honest, you know, with what they call with Space Force, right? Which, you know, just last week they assigned a general to head Space Command. There is a lot of growing area. You know, as, as I say, you don't, if you think about the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, you don't have to bomb a country into the Stone Age. If you disable their satellites, you've disabled most of everything they can do. And therefore, they can't do anything. Anyone from banking to electricity to moving troops, right? That is the way I think future conflicts will be done is through space uh, interaction and interference. All right. Well, we've thoroughly scared everyone that's listening. So let's move on to the red planet. Another, a different scary place. (laughs) A different scary place because uh, we need oxygen to survive over there. But uh, I believe that it's, uh, or it went billions of years ago, of course. And uh, but new research has uh, discovered that there are rivers that survived for for a few billion years after. Yeah, Mars is an interesting place. It has a lot of CO two, and we think that most of the habitable atmosphere, as you said, disappeared about three billion years ago. And so we kind of naturally thought, okay, well, we know Mars or we believe Mars had water. We can see evidence for it on the ground. So the water probably evaporated at that time. But it doesn't appear to be the case. It appears that the rivers actually survived for another 2 billion years. And in fact, they actually like expanded almost to form billabongs all over the planet. In fact, Mars would have probably had at the time a larger surface area covered by water than Earth would have had 2 to 3 billion years ago, which is pretty wild. Uh, and it's obviously important when we think of looking for life or signs of life or the past history of life on the red planet, which would have been, I guess, more blue planet than Earth would have been three million years ago. Yeah, it's really interesting. It, it's really fascinating to think about as well because um, there, there is the research saying that there is water ice uh, in the in the polar caps as well. So is it possible that Mars has this ice water ready to go, ready for some scientific breakthrough of terraforming? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think ice, I think, and there's also subterranean ground water reservoirs, essentially kind of like it would be a lot like living in Australia where you'd have to dig down and find a water reservoir. And so when the next rovers land in 2020, 2021, 
they will have signs or tools to detect signs of life. And again, being bacteria, simple organisms. But, you know, there's a strong chance that it's likely to find this, right? That if water was so prevalent, and we know life here needs water, so it's not naive to think life would need or use water on uh, Mars, that it probably is going to be finding something interesting in only a few years' time. And that's kind of crazy to think that we might have evidence of life aliens somewhere else beyond the earth in only three years it's absolutely incredible and i think i was just reading the article as well uh should we be worried about these solar particles that stripped away mars's atmosphere well this is this is part of the question is how exactly did mars lose its atmosphere right you know we know that we have this giant magnetic bubble because we have this iron core turning in the center of our planet causing this magnetic bubble that protects us from the solar radiation Something happened on Mars that it stopped and therefore wiped away the, the Martian atmosphere. So that's why there's a lot of work into studying the whole planet of Mars is because there's analogs to Earth. And then, you know, we can conversely look at Venus, something also like Earth, but it's had a runaway greenhouse where it's this terrible place to live. So, you know, when we see Mars and we see Venus, we see different sides of what Earth could or could not be. And so that's a very important thing to understand the history of what our planet is and, and could be. My, my science fiction brain here is wondering whether uh, Mars and Venus were the test cases for a super advanced alien race <laughs> and they got Earth right. That's right. You know, maybe the recipe was, uh, you know, we, we got it right for Earth. And it's important then to think that if we're looking for life, there are strong possibilities that life existed on Mars and there could be signs there. And the same with Venus. Venus is hard to get to because it, the sulfuric acid destroys instruments, but that has that isn't stopping people from trying to get to Venus. To There might be, you know, there is a crazy idea that there could be fossils on Mars and Venus that we just haven't discovered yet. Well, look, the stepping stone to get to Mars uh, seems to be the moon. Uh, US Vice President Mike Pence has come out uh, in a speech recently and uh, basically told NASA that their nine-year goal of getting back to the moon is too long for him. That's right. They have accelerated by four years to get to 2024. And look, you know, this isn't a new thing in terms of a president saying, let's go back to the moon. But Obama and Bush both said it. They always quote eight to nine years down the road because it's at the end of potentially their second term. So they can take the glory without being blasted for budgetary spending by moving it forward. It really is. They want to do this. There is a new moon race between China, uh, the U.S., India, Israel, private companies. Uh, and how exactly that's going to be done, no one knows. In fact, they just had a special town hall uh, led by the U.S. administrator, uh, Jim Bernstein, with government employees, how are we going to do this? And one option being floated is that if the NASA rocket isn't ready, the space launch system, what's called the Orion capsule, the, the new space shuttle essentially, that is ready to go. They might be hitching rides on private companies like SpaceX or United Launch Alliance to get to the moon to meet that 2024 goal. So a very lofty goal of only five years of getting humans back to the moon. Is it accelerating the timeline too much? Like, is it too fast? Are we potentially risking lives? Well, that, that is a worry, right? You know, this was, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consultation with the community, in fact, who's uh the head of human space flight, who is kind of one of the, the elder states people because they've done this for a while and that's the critical part with humans in space. There are questions about how it's gonna happen. And so it's gonna, we'll have to see how this unfolds. Uh, but what it is a sign of that there is this big push to the moon. Uh, you know, and today, this year is 50, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing later in July. Um, so I think we'll see an increase of activity We'll see rampings off of, of equipment sent to the moon. I think we'll have to wait to see exactly when humans are getting to the moon, but it sounds like it's going to be sooner rather than later. Well, let's jump back a few million years now, 66 million years, in fact, and uh, jump over to Mexico. Uh, the Yucatan Peninsula has uh, unveiled some of its secrets recently uh, in the world of paleontology. Yeah, so, you know, there's always been the theory that a massive asteroid hit the Earth caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. And fossils recently released from a dig in the northern part of the US have actually found fish with glass in it. Now you might be wondering why is this important? Well, in order for glass to be formed, you must have had some heat, some energy turn sand into glass. So the idea was an asteroid hit the ground, caused sand to burn up, fling up to the Earth's atmosphere along with the fish, melt and then form in 
the fish, essentially, uh, and then come back down. So this actually could be a dig or a sign from the literally day or days the asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. What does it mean for paleontology? What does it mean for our understanding of, of this um, mass extinction event? Well, I think it's important because, you know, we also see footprints of dinosaurs at this site, right? So we know dinosaurs, when this event happened, were there. And then dinosaurs happen to not be there. And I think this is this, this maybe the smoking gun that, yes, this asteroid event did happen and caused a global climate shift. And that this is what led the end of the dinosaurs or that evolutionary change uh, on this planet. Um, that, that, that clear, undefiable evidence. Now, other people want to get in and look at the fossils, obviously. They, there's this, it's a very large dig, as you said, in the North Dakota area. The problem is they obviously worry about poachers and everything like that. So, you know, careful stewardship of the site is important. But the fact that they might have that site that was impacted or a site of impact from this event 66 million years ago is beyond what you could have imagined. And, of course, that area is uh, Hell Creek, which not only is in North Dakota, but it's also in Montana, South Dakota and Wyoming as well. So there's obviously plenty of stuff uh, to, to discover out there. That's right. I think that the, the the surface is only being scratched and we'll see a lot more discoveries coming out of it. Fantastic, Brad. Well, thank you very much for talking science and we look forward to uh, chatting with you next week. Catch you next week. Well, thanks for watching and listening to this edition of a Trek Zone Conversation. It's the new series, Talk and Science with Dr. Brad Tucker. My thanks to Brad for agreeing to co-produce this podcast with me. Uh, it's an absolute thrill to have such a genius on board the show uh, and telling us all about the science and space news of the week. Be sure to catch Brad on his socials. The details are on the screen if you're watching YouTube or if you're listening to me. Uh, it's btucker22 on Twitter and Dr. Brad Tucker on Facebook. There's all sorts of great stuff that he posts, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Be sure to catch the next edition of A Trek Zone Conversation, regular episodes on Fridays at 8.30am Brisbane time. This week, Lee's back with the Talkin' Trek series. This time around, we're talking the animated adventures. I'm very much looking forward to that one. Would love to hear your thoughts uh, in comments on that video when it goes live on Friday. Of course, it is live right now for Trek Zone members over on Patreon, so be sure to just jump over there and sign up. Any amount that you can uh, spare to help Trekzone become even better is greatly appreciated. That's over on patreon.com slash trekzoneorgau. Well, that's science and space news for week 14 of 2019. I'm Matt Miller, and we'll see you next week.